to embark on a deep exploration into the Jewish Passover and solve many mysteries along the way to include the manna from heaven. Please note, I fully realize that these metaphysical viewpoints may seem to go against the common understanding of a traditionalist. However, instead of detracting from the traditional viewpoint, my intent is that these metaphysical points of view complement the foundation of tradition. In other words, I'm not on some foolish quest to tear down someone's religion. Rather, I prefer to build it up and strengthen it with knowledge and insight. Now, some of you may have never read the biblical passages in regard to Exodus, and in particular about the mysterious sustenance called manna. So feel free to pause these next few slides and read the excerpts from Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 36. Finally, Numbers chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. These are the passages directly related to manna. Now on the right, I have summarized the key components of the story, which we'll go over in depth. It is essential to know that manna fell from heaven while the Jews wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, just after their exodus from Egypt and the famous scene of Moses parting the Red Sea. Now Jewish scripture tells us that the exodus took place on the 15th of the first month of the Jewish religious year, which is 15 Nisan or 15 April, which traditionally means first fruits. It's important to note that prior to Babylonian captivity, this month was called Aviv, which traditionally means barley ripening, but literally translates as Father 12. So in order to understand why, you have to know a little about astronomy and the celestial cycles. So just like many other ancient cultures, the Hebrew calendar is a lunisolar calendar, which have additional intercalation rules due to the phases of the moon. For example, Every, every third year is called an embolismic year, where a 13th month called a leap month is intercalated to keep this type of calendar on track with the solar year. Passover has a primary fixed date of 15 Nisan or 15 April, but also has a flexible date range due to the 19 year lunar cycle called the metonic cycle. This means that Passover can range over the lunar cycle anywhere from 23 March up to 25 April. However, the primary Passover date is pinned to 15 Nisan, which acts as the fulcrum or balancing point of the cycle. Furthermore, there are additional agricultural nuances, such as the observance that the Passover doesn't officially begin until the barley ripens and various other phenomena. If the barley isn't ripe, a 13th intercalated month is added, and due to the nature of this sort of time reckoning, sometimes this intercalary month, called Adar, will be condensed into a period of just one day prior to 15 Nisan. So the question arises, why is 15 April considered Passover? And the answer is found within the sidereal celestial chart called the Solar Analemma. The Solar Analemma is a celestial cycle that tracks the annual path of the sun. And you can find this imprinted on any globe. What this chart depicts is a reconciliation of two different ways to track solar time, those being the apparent solar time and the mean solar time. The mathematical formula used for this reconciliation is called the equation of time. Now the shape of the analemma is due to the eccentricity and obliquity of the Earth, which results in the figure eight shape. This is particularly important to remember as the number eight is metaphysically correlated with the sun. In other words, the sun equals the number eight. Now the significance of the sun and its numerical equivalent of eight can be found all over Jewish teachings. We have the eight days of the Passover festival. We also have the eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles, which honors the Israelites 40 year wandering through the wilderness with the eighth and final day being known as the day of the great feast. And while the second month of the Jewish religious calendar is when the Israelites entered the wilderness, this month is also the eighth month of the civil calendar. And the Jewish day of circumcision is one January, or eight days, past December 25th, the annual birth of the sun. From the astronomical point of view, one January is perihelion, or the day that the sun is closest to the allegorically viewed as the marriage of the sun and the earth. Now looking at the solar analemma, there are three or four nodal points, depending on your point of view. The prime orbital node is the midpoint or point of balance, which acts as a double node for two key dates, 
those being April 15th on the left, which is the day that the sun ascends above or passes over this nodal point, and the other being 29 August on the right, which is the day that the sun descends below or falls under the nodal point, heralding the season of fall. So now you can see the fundamental celestial reason why the primary Passover is pinned to 15 April, as it is indeed the day that the sun passes over. However, did you know that April 15th is also known throughout antiquity as tax day? In specific to our topic at hand, the Jews are required to tithe in support of both Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. And anyone under the thumb of the IRS knows that April 15th is tax day. There's truly nothing new under the sun. Now, opposite to April 15th is 29 August, which is the day that the sun descends below this nodal point. Notice that 29 August is eight days into Virgo. In other words, 21 August, the beginning of Virgo, plus eight days equals 29 August. And Christians, this is undoubtedly the celestial fractal of the Virgin Mary, pregnant with God's son, and to which she gave birth while Jesus' foster father, Joseph, was away, wait for it, paying taxes. Or how about Hare Krishna, who is the eighth avatar of Lord Vishnu? His birthday is also celebrated on the eighth day of the Hindu month, Bhadrapada, which is August. Did you know that Krishna's foster father, Nanda, was also away paying taxes? Or did you know that 29 August is the official birthday of the god Thoth? Or that 29 August is the day that Jesus began his ministry? Or that 29 August marks the beheading of John the Baptist? Or that 29 August marks the sunset beheading of Jayadratha on the 14th day of the Kurukshetra War? Or Arjuna beheaded him and then shot him in the head with an arrow? Or that 29 August falls within the first month of the Islamic New Year, and specifically on 29 August 2020, the Sunni Muslims commemorated Ashura, which marks the parting of the Red Sea by Moses. Or that 29 August 2020, the Shia Muslims commemorated the death of uh, Hussein ibn Ali, a grandson of Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was beheaded during the Battle of Karbala. Or that 29 August fits the astrotheological scene where Artemis, the virgin moon goddess, accidentally shoots Orion in the head while he's swimming in the ocean. Or that 29 August is named Arcadius in the Greek Orthodox Church, which is named after from Arcus, who was Arcadia's greatest hunter, whereupon he went into the wilderness and accidentally shot his mother with an arrow, or that he himself was born from Zeus, who was disguised as Artemis. Or that 29 August is the birth of the Mayan fifth sun, or that 28 August was a sacrificial day to Sol and Luna on the Roman ritual calendar, or that 29 August or one thoth is the beginning of the Coptic New Year, or that 29 August is the Feast of Job, or that 29 August 516 BC God told Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple, or that 29 August 70 AD marks the destruction of the second temple of Jerusalem, or that 29 August 2018 the unblemished red heifer was born in Jerusalem, happy birthday red cow, or that 29 August 2021 marked the Buddhist festival which commemorates the ancestors, or that 29 August is a general date for the Buddhist honeymoon festival that commemorates the occasion where Buddha retreated into the wilderness. And the list continues. And we haven't even discussed the other two nodes on the solar enolema, which are the summer and winter solstices respectively. And you may notice that this makes a cross. So now that you have a decent education on the solar enolema, let's close out this slide by redirecting our thoughts back to the significance of 15 April which is the day the sun passes over the central orbital node and marks the Jewish festival. Now you just received a fair amount of knowledge about the sun. So now we're going to switch from the solar point of view to a lunar point of view. However, I'm going to overlay this lunar information on the tropical astrological calendar, also known as the standard zodiac wheel. In other words, I'm going to use another solar wheel as a visual, but this time I'm going to primarily discuss the moon. So let's orient ourselves. Our first overlay is highlighted in blue, which depicts the period of time that the sun traverses on the solar analema from the central orbital node. Next, we'll depict the vernal equinox in red and the autumnal equinox in blue, which is the time period when the sun ascends above and then descends below the equator with the equatorial lines marking the technical beginning of spring at the beginning of Aries and autumn at the beginning of Libra, respectively. Next, draw the solstitial line from north to south in purple. This line marks the summer solstice above at the beginning of Cancer and the winter solstice below at the beginning of Capricorn. You can think of this line as the rest line, as this is when the soul is still, hence solstice. 
Or you could think of it as the God line, because one of the known paradoxical attributes of God is that it must be at rest or still. And if you don't know this, study the philosophy of what is called the unmoved mover. Now notice that while our solar and alemic central orbital node of 15 April and 29 August do not line up with the equatorial axis of 21 March and 21 September on our tropical chart, conversely, our solstitial line, the God line, our purple line, does indeed line up with the same two nodes on the solar analemma. Thus, this firmly pins these two models together along the resting axis of the soul. The Passover celebration ends on 21 April, so this also pins the solar analemic festival to the tropical year. Notice that the Passover straddles the cusp of Aries and Taurus. From the point of view of the zodiacal ages, this is the portion of the Exodus story where Moses comes down from the mountain, only to find the Hebrews had made and were worshipping a golden calf called the sin of the calf. The allegory symbolizes the transition from the age of Taurus to the age of Aries. Take note that this famous painting by Filipino Lippi in the 15th century of the worship of the golden calf. Notice the golden calf is floating in the clouds and has a moon affixed to its shoulder. You may also notice that the rock outcropping on the left resembles a penis while the rock outcropping on the right resembles a female figure, who is most certainly Venus, the ruler of Taurus. Notice that the troop of 16 Hebrews are subdivided into the large group of 13 and the small group of 3, with both 13 and 3 being the most prominently associated numbers with the moon. Notice the centrally located woman playing a lyre, the constellation of Lyra being at its zenith directly due north in Cancer, which is ruled by the moon. Notice the arbor vitae, located in between the forearms of the bull. Notice that the eighth figure appears to be stabbing the ninth figure in the back of the head, nine being the number that rules the mind. And it is the numbers eight and nine that circle the square. Notice that figure nine and figure ten are actually the same man, being symbolic of the older man having circled his square, transmogrifying into his youthful and saved self, having attained salvation, completion, or perfection. Ladies and gentlemen, this entire painting is a very clever, symbolic rendition of killing the lower mind, that is, the cerebellum, which Taurus rules, and which is the seat of your base desires, most notably lust. And secondly, it illustrates the Israelites' reluctance to accept the transition from the old age of Taurus into the new age of Aries. And all of this information is found within the tiny sliver of the zodiac. With our focus on Aries, now you can understand why the Israelites blow the shofar or the ram horn. For the traditional point of view, the Jews procure an unblemished lamb for sacrifice and use its blood to wipe on the lentils or doorposts in order to protect them from the final plague consisting of the death of every firstborn. But from the astrological point of view, you can see that the lamb opens the doorway of the year. And let's also look at the word Passover. Etymologically, the word Passover comes from the Akkadian word Passahu, which means blow, as in blowing the ram horn. And the Jewish Passover is synchronistic with the Christian suffering of Jesus before his crucifixion, called the Passion of the Christ. In Greek mythology, this syncretizes with Pasiphae, the wife of King Minos and the mother of Minotaurus. Now, Exodus tells us that the Israelites entered the wilderness on the 15th day of the second month, which is 15 AR or 15 May. Now, May is Maus in Latin, which is derived from the Greek goddess Maya or Maya, who is the oldest of the Pleiadians. And the Pleiades is the most prominent asterism in Taurus. The Roman poet Ovid gives us a second etymology where he said that May is Latin for Maoris, which means elders, and the following month of June is Latin for Junioris, or young people, which is where we get our modern English word junior. And isn't it interesting that this etymology also fits the description of the ninth and tenth figures standing directly under the bull in Lippi's famous painting. And June begins the sign of Gemini, which rules the arms. Now look at the intertwined arms of the elder and the younger. Etymology of May is also cognate with the second month of the Jewish religious calendar, named Ar, which means blossom. 
However, before the Babylonian captivity, the month was called Ziv, which means glow or light, which is an obvious reference to the glowing ball in the night sky called the moon, which is exalted in Taurus. Now, 15 May is the exact date the Hebrews entered the wilderness of sin, and sin is the Babylonian moon god. In Christianity, this became the concept of sin. In fact, Passover is celebrated on the first full moon after the vernal equinox, which means that the Hebrews entered the wilderness of sin on the second full moon. And the book of Numbers even tells us uh, that the specific sin of the mixed multitude was falling into lust. And what did the children of Israel complain about? If you guessed that they complained about being hungry, you guessed wrong. Go back and read the story. Even though it alludes to physical hunger, the actual complaint by the children of Israel was that their souls had dried away. This is because spiritual books teach you about spiritual things, and the type of hunger they were complaining about was spiritual hunger. Now, Taurus is exalted by the moon, but it is ruled by Venus. These astronomical planetary placements are in perfect correlation with the spring season. For example, Venus is the goddess of beauty, sex, fertility, and love, and is often confused a negative polarized version called lust. Doesn't it make sense as the springtime brings life back to the world in the form of a yearly world orgasm? The birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees. Everything blossoms to life in the springtime, and the moon plays a prominent role. It has long been known that the cycles of the moon affect plant growth, Gardening is best if done by the phases of the moon. Just look inside of a farmer's almanac. It's confirmed that sap flow in plants becomes fuller as the moon waxes and conversely slows down as the moon wanes. And this is the same for leaf growth. The moon also affects soil moisture, which is a key component in the germination of seeds. And just the same, the moon also affects human growth. Cutting your hair during the waxing moon promises longer and fuller regrowth, while the waning moon does the opposite. And the moon is undeniably syncretized with fertility in the female menstrual cycle. So, putting it all together, you can see the sacred feminine fractal manifested between the interrelationship of Venus, the moon, fertility, etc. Ladies, perhaps you can now understand why your uterus fractally resembles a cow's head, or why your udders produce milk, or why cows are so sacred or why Luna turns people into emotional lunatics, or why one of the foods during Passover are hard-boiled eggs dipped in salt. And I'll give you one guess what the salt water metaphysically symbolizes. Now, the period of 40 days prior to the Passover is significant because this is the time when the sun's rays are lengthening, transitioning our world out of the death of winter and into the life of spring. Notice that this period straddles the vernal equinox. In mythological context, this is where the blood of the virgin lamb is smeared on the lintel. The 40 days of the temptation of Christ in the wilderness called Lent. The 40 years of the Hebrews wandering in the wilderness. The 40 days and 40 nights of Elijah's travels to Mount Horeb, which is exactly the same place that Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights, then received the Ten Commandments. It's also the 40 days and 40 nights in Noah's Ark. It's also the 40 days of the morning of Tammuz, and if we reach all the way back to the Sumerians, we find that 40 was the sacred number of Enki, the Lord Earth. Aries is most often represented by the ram or lamb, but it is also biblically symbolized as the donkey. So perhaps it's easier to remember that the equinox births the equine than the ox. The sun is exalted in Aries, while the moon, or sin, is exalted in Taurus. The sun is masculine, and the moon is feminine. And now you can understand why the word woman is a portmanteau for womb man. And perhaps you can now make sense of scriptures like these. And we certainly should recall that the Messiah rides a donkey through the Golden Gate of Jerusalem. Now, Pisces and its opposition Virgo features as a prominent component of these stories, as Pisces houses the constellation Columba, the dove, while Virgo houses Corvus, the raven. And the scriptures tell us that Elijah was fed by ravens and the Hebrews were fed by quail. 
And God told Abraham to sacrifice both a ram and a dove, among other things. And the scriptures also tell us that Noah released the raven and the dove. And if we go all the way back to the Sumerians, we find that Enki tells the boatman Utnapishtim to release a raven and a dove in order to find dry land. And in Christianity, the dove is one of the most sacred images, as it directly symbolizes both peace and the Holy Spirit. And we can easily see that from the seasonal point of view, the white dove symbolizes ascending above the vernal equinox, bringing us the life of spring, while the black raven descends below the autumnal equinox, falling through autumn and into the cold, deadly embrace of winter. Pisces also features the constellation of Pegasus, which houses the field of Pegasus, also called the Great Square of Pegasus. In Greek mythology, Poseidon, who rejoices in Pisces, sired Pegasus and his brother Chrysaor, whose name literally means Christ's sword or the golden sword. And you can be certain that this celestial sword in the sky is the exact same magical sword that all our Savior figures wield because this sword tells us when the knowledge returns. And in Jewish literature, this is the sword and field of Amalek and Ephron's field that Abraham purchased. So we've talked about the East and the fast. Now we'll discuss the feast, but first the yeast. But now you should understand that at the core of it all, the Passover is a lunar fertility ritual in celebration of the divine feminine. And as such, we don't want our ladies out of balance in other words, no yeast, especially during the season of procreation. Now, Venus rules Friday, and on this day, Jewish women light two candles, cover their two eyes, and recite a prayer 18 minutes before sunset, symbolic of the 18 minutes it takes for leaven to rise. It's also worth it to note that if a situation arises where it is necessary for a man to light a candle, he must light it without a woman in the household. Jews then began the ritual of meticulously searching out and removing all leaven products from the home by candlelight. On the first night of Passover, Jews are obligated to eat meor, which is a plate of five bitter herbs, consisting of, among other things, bitter lettuce, the salt dib egg, and the onion. Now, from the traditional point of view, Meror symbolizes the bitterness of enslavement in Egypt. However, from the celestial, agricultural, and ritual points of view, you can also clearly see that these food items are fractals of the moon. Notice that the 18th tarot card is the moon. In truth of the feminine fractal, we also find fractals of Venus within the ritual fertility feast. Venus is known as the pearl, and her symbol is the mirror. The essence of this etymological fractal is found in the Kemetic Mer, which means pyramid, the Semitic Meror, or Moror, or Mirror, or, and Mer, which among other things is an aphrodisiac. The mission even specifies five types of bitter herbs to be placed on the setter plate, and five is the sacred number of Venus. Her stellar conjunctions form the celestial pentagram, which is all about balance because it is nature's shape that produces optimal torque. This is why most flowers have five petals, while the best balanced ceiling fans have five blades, and even why most cars have wheels with five lug nuts. Even the optimal way to tighten the lug nuts is in a pentagonal pattern. Now, the most important and mystical food in the Passover story is manna, also called the bread from heaven. In fact, it is so mysterious that even the etymology of the word manna is traditionally and mystically said to have derived from the question manhu, which is Semitic, means what is it? Now, the book of Exodus never conclusively identifies manna. However, it does give us many allegorical descriptives, which we will discuss at length. But in general, the scriptures say that the dew lay around the host, and when the dew was gone, behold, small round things lay upon the face of the wilderness, to which the children of Israel called manna, for they knew not what it was, and Moses called it the bread from which God has given you to eat. So what is it? How beautiful to know that man is the moon, for the moon alone fits the description. Man is the dew that lay around the host, and the moon is the host. When the dew fell at night, the manna fell upon it, and true to form, the moon reflects within each and every dewdrop. Ladies and gentlemen, 
This is a very subtle metaphorical masterpiece about attaining illumination through your own self-reflection. Zen Master Dojin said it this way, a drop of water can reflect the whole sky. And how I propose that the fractal planted it in his book titled Moon in a Dewdrop. And if you don't understand this, perhaps I can rephrase it for you and say, there is but one moon in many drops. And if you're still lost in the wilderness of your mind, perhaps I can be clear when I say there is one universal mind that is reflected within all of your minds. And from the planetary point of view, it is the moon that rules the mind. For the modern hermetic on the quest to become a mind-born son, your scriptures say it this way. And here's God dispensing the manna. Notice the cowhead Moses has blue hair from which protrudes two bovine horns. Notice Columba in the form of the quail for your consumption. So go have a big old delicious bowl of self-reflected moon ball soup. Compliments of God, because that's exactly what it is. A symbolic bowl of manna, a reflection of the moon. And a reminder for your mind and for you to mind your mind. So now that we know it's the moon, this takes care of the top three descriptors and partially solves the fourth. Because if you guessed that the morning is ruled by the moon, you'd be correct as the morning begins at midnight. Now, ninth and tenth from the top, we note that manna is not the coriander seed, but rather it is like the coriander seed. So what does a coriander seed look like? Well, it looks like a tiny onion. So we'll add that to our ingredients. But take note, this is only a superficial solution because this fractal goes much deeper. So for now, we'll call these two partially solved. And in regard to the tenth, we'll note that Arabic bedellium is a whitish color. And so is the moon, or an onion, or a pearl. So we'll call the tenth two thirds of the way solved because the fractal of bedellium goes deeper as well. So for now, let's take a pause on these and solve the remainder of these mysterious passages for you. The first thing to notice is that the moon is exalted in Taurus. However, the moon rules Cancer, which begins on the summer solstice at the noon position. Now the next sign is Leo, and it is ruled by the sun at the two o'clock position or high noon. And this corresponds with Exodus 16.21 that says manna melted when the sun waxed hot. And Bedellium does as well. And the sixth sign is Virgo, which is the house of bread. And in accordance with Exodus 16.22, the Israelites gathered two portions of manna on this day in preparation for the coming Sabbath. And if you think that's amazing, how does it feel to know that overall these passages are describing your pineal activation? In scripture, oil and honey are always allude to a pineal activation. Do you know that your pineal is wrapped in a honeycomb-like or wafered structure that secretes oil, anointing your pineal? In Hinduism, this oil or honey is called the nectar of immortality. And the Greeks knew it as ambrosia and manna juice, the immortal food or drink of the gods. For these reasons and more, biblical scripture tells you that the man that gathered much had nothing over and he that gathered little had no lack. In other words, you'll always have the perfect amount. Tell me, what are the chances that these passages rest in Exodus 16:18, which is a fractal of the golden ratio or the perfect proportion? And for further understanding, read the Gospel of Philip. It tells you directly that the oil is the chrism, that chrism is the light, that resurrection comes from the chrism, that you receive the trinity in the chrism, and that when you do, you are no longer a Christian. You are Christ. And this sacred marriage is very often set within the allegorical framework of the bridegroom and the mirrored bedchamber. Have you ever heard of the fertility ritual called a honeymoon? And think how often pregnancy is equated with baking bread. Ladies and gentlemen, these are all fractals of one another. So our checklist is coming along nicely. Now you know that the root or essence of the word morning is cognate with the moon. You also know why no matter how much or little the Israelites gathered, it was always the perfect amount. 
You also know why the manna melted when the sun waxed hot, and why they gathered for two days worth in preparation for the coming Sabbath. Now, let's tackle the first portion of the bottom bullet point on the checklist, which says that the Israelites baked cakes with the manna. Now, phi, the golden ratio, just like manna, is the mathematically proven perfect amount or perfect portion because it is the perfect proportion. What does this mean from the geometrical point of view? Well, if you take the moon and balance it on top of the earth, you'll find that it mathematically circles as a square. In other words, given the diameter of the earth, draw a triangle from the base of the earth to the moon, and you'll find that triangle's apex touches the center of the moon. Now, if you draw a circle from the apex and a square around the earth, it geometrically circles the square. Now, this triangle is composed of two very special Pythagorean triangles. This triangle is the only right triangle whose sides are in arithmetic progression being 3, 4, and 5. And for a, a quick mental note, notice that pi equals 3.1415. It's just the same. If you scale the Pythagorean triangle down to a base of unit 1, you get the only right triangle whose edge lengths are in geometric progression, those being 1, the square root of phi, and phi. Now, please listen to me closely, ladies and gentlemen. From here, all you have to do is apply scaling factor, and you'll get every harmonic number known to mankind. For example, in this master diagram, you'll find pi, phi, e, which is Euler's constant rate of growth, 36, 72, 144, 432, 440, 864, 2160, 5040, all the sulfur frequencies and socket per permutations of all those frequencies, etc. In other words, I've attempted to anchor your thought in the 345 Pythagorean triangle and scaled it down to the lowest unit called base 1, which gave you the Kepler triangle. And since you're now at the base level of unit 1, all you have to do is scale this up to solve for all harmonic sequences. Now this triangle in the middle is the exact dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Giza, and the word pyramid is cognate with meaning fire in the middle. However, the pyramid's name etymologically comes from the Greek word pyramus, which means wheat cake, which is a clever double entendre referring to the sacred cakes that were baked into the pyramidal shape. These cakes were holy offerings and were of central importance during ritual feasts, especially the New Year feast, because cakes and various other baked goods would be decorated with inscriptions and spells. Round cakes were decorated with lines to resemble the rays of the sun. Women made cakes as an offering to the temple priests who guarded the Great Pyramid. And this ancient ritual survives to this very day among the diaspora of Egyptian-influenced Middle Eastern cultures. For example, cakes are one of the most important features of the Eid al-Fitr, which is the sunset feast marking the end of Ramadan. So to close this thought, you can now clearly see the allegorical symbolism in the Jewish story of the Passover. The cake is symbolic of a pyramid, which in turn is symbolic of your pineal, and both the honey and fresh oil are symbolic of the flowing chrism, which culminates in a pineal activation and true salvation. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, my mind falls into an eternity, so I'll keep this section short and give you a few observations to get you started. Notice that the moon's diameter is 2,160 miles, while the zodiacal age for Aeon is 2,160 years. Notice that Pi sits directly due west, by halfway around the zodiac, which is exactly where the sun sits. And this is in perfect complement to a Bible verse I read once upon a time. And many people don't understand how pi and phi are related, so here's a logarithmic equation showing not only the pi and phi relationship, but also the mirroring inverse relationship of 2 and 5. And if you wish to view a really clean version, convert it into a trigonomic function and you get this nice clean formula. And for a super clean equation, convert it into this fourfold formula. Speaking of the fourfold quality of light, which includes the sequences of 1, 4, and 7, and all of its orders of magnitude and cyclic permutation, 
Perhaps it will interest you to know that the Great Pyramid featured 144,000 virgin white casing stones upon each of its four faces that were polished to an accuracy of within one one hundredth of an inch, which sealed this magnificent structure. This also reminds me of a few Bible verses I read once upon a time. Did you know that there was were 144,000 disciples of Muhammad, peace be upon him, or the King Herod slaughtered 144,000 children looking for baby Jesus? Or that there are 144,000 doors in Valhalla? Or that the tribes of Israel numbered 144,000? Or that the side length of New Jerusalem is 144,000 furlongs, which means the city is 144,000 squared? And this list continues. Ladies and gentlemen, the more you look at it, the more it reveals itself. Why is all of this important? It is important because it holds the immutable proof of the invisible hand of God. It mathematically proves that even though on the practical level of your everyday common experience on the surface of reality, if you apply your mind and cultivate a keen eye and astute observation for the subtleties within nature, you'll find that on every scale, from flowers to the human anatomy to the universe itself, everything is in divine proportion. And since everything is in proportion, everything is in harmony and balance. And since everything is in harmony, balance, and proportion, everything conclusively has a common thread. And that common thread tells us that everything must be a fractal of everything else. The astute observation of this as above, so below ratio was called logos by the ancient Greeks, and logoi, or mercury, was its personification. Ladies and gentlemen, this answer is why all sacred sites around the world, throughout the entirety of human history, are built on some harmonic node or sacred geographic feature. This is why all sacred sites are built using harmonic measurements. This is why all sacred sites are aligned within the divine order of the universe. Our ancestors left us the subtle yet immutable proof of God right in front of our eyes. We've just been blinded by the illusion of mundane experience, base knowledge with no wisdom, all used by selfish and superficial mental midgets attempting to drag you down to their own mundane level and desperately convince you that all there is to this world is random chaos and chance brought about by nothing more than lifeless and cold chemical processes which serve as a foundation for nothing more to be desired than superficial pleasures and with no hope of anything more than to satisfy these base desires through quick dopamine hit concepts like consumerism and instant gratification. Your sleeping minds have been captured by a corporate paradigm designed to rip your faith away from God and put it squarely in the lap of the state. In other words, you've been bamboozled. Time to wake up. Listen to me. This one slide sequence proves that there is a divine order in everything. An order implies immutable universal laws that no matter how much lesser men attempt to refute or so desperately break, they are inextricably bound by these same laws. So the question is not if there is order, but who or what ordered it. The question is not if there are known and observable universal laws, but who or what created those observable, testable, and repeatable laws. The question is not if God is, but rather what God is. And it is light. And I'm here to show it to you. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be fooled by the illusion of the world. You just had a lesson in Metaphysical Banking 101, and we baked a beautiful cake together. So we'll give this bullet point a green light. So at this time, let's go back to our ingredients and continue our fractal exploration of coriander. Now starting from the bottom, our modern English word coriander etymologically comes from the French coriandre, which is from the Latin coriandrum, which derives from the ancient Greek Corianon and also Coriandron, which further comes from Mycenaean Greek word Coriadana, which is constructed as Coriadon and which is cognate with Ariande and her Roman equivalent 
Ariana. Now in the Roman form, you can easily see that her name is a portmanteau of Aries and Anna. And in this instance, convey the sun and the moon straddling the equator. And as the moon, Anna is also Mana and Enana and Nana Sin and even Anna the prophetess in the New Testament, who is only found in the Gospel of Luke. Venus ruling Taurus is personified as Luke, just as Venus exalted in Pisces is personified as Lucifer. Now you understand why Luke's Christian symbol is the flying bull. Now, true to the fractal, there are many orders of magnitude or levels or degrees or allotments or aspects to planetary and other phenomena. Let's give you an example. When some ancient poet refers to the relationship of the sun and moon, they may be referring to any number of fractal relationships. Quite often, they are referring to the sun and moon relationship on the vernal equinox. Or they may be referring to this sun moon exaltation relationship, the sun being exalted in Aries and the moon being exalted in Taurus. Or they may be referring to their rulership relationship, the sun ruling Leo and the moon ruling Cancer. Or they may be referring to their equatorial relationship on the autumnal equinox. Or they may be referring to their overall diurnal relationship of the sun ruling the day and the moon ruling the night. And many times they'll be referring to any combination of these aspects within a single story. The trick is being able to move your mind through the fractal in order to understand what perspective the author was coming from in that given moment. Now, in addition to orders of magnitude within the masculine and feminine relationship, each individual polarity have their own internal orders of magnitude as well. In an example, the sacred feminine begins with the moon, then unfolds into its higher orders of magnitude of Venus, then Sirius, then Vega, then the Pleiades, then Andromeda. An easy way to remember how to unfold the feminine fractal is by its luminosity. What does this mean? Well, have you noticed that all the brightest things in the night sky are feminine? The brightest moon in the night sky is our own moon. The brightest planet is Venus. Sirius is the brightest equatorial star. Vega is the brightest circumpolar star. The Pleiades is the brightest asterism. And Andromeda is the brightest galaxy. Now, a third component of thinking within the fractal is that portmanteaus or conjunctive naming conventions don't always add up on the same level or order. And Ariadne is a perfect example to outline this phenomenon. For example, her Roman equivalent is Ariana and is indeed indicative of the sun and moon. Yet, although Anna is the moon, Ari comes from Aries, which is Mars in Greek. This mismatch of orders of magnitude is due to a few factors. Not to say the least that our mind actually works in this fractal manner, and as such, we're constantly shifting viewpoints. And to make this even more difficult, and the fact that the multiple minds of various authors have told the tale from their own changing perspectives, then Pepper, the fact of letting this marinate for a few hundred or thousand years, and what you get is what you have now, which is a recipe of utter confusion for anyone who is stuck in the rut of mundane linear thinking. In other words, the only way to solve this is to shift your mind into the fractal, then unravel the varying points of view, polarities, and orders of magnitude. So, due to these reasons and more, there are many variations to the myth of Ariana. But know that her most prominent point of view is as Venus ruling Taurus. In fact, according to the Hellenistic mythographer Paeon of Amethyst, an ancient cult of Aphrodite, Ariadne, was observed on the island of Cyprus. And in one account, one of her many children is named Tauropolis, which literally translates as the city of Taurus. And we also know that she was the consort to the Theseus and Dionysus. In other accounts, this is because both Theseus and Dionysus are the constellation Orion, which is located in Taurus. And Hesion tells you outright that Dionysus is Osiris. Now, 
Ariana is also the sister of the Minotaur, which is obviously Taurus. She is also the daughter of King Minos, who is the son of the lustful Zeus, who transmogrified into a white bull and absconded with Europa and took her to the island of Crete, where he impregnated her with Minos. And there are many more bull motifs throughout these myths. So we can clearly see that this entire genealogy is a fractal enfoldment of the age of Taurus and which corroborates the Exodus passages which state that manna was like coriander because both the Jews and the Greeks are talking about the age of Taurus. For the sake of brevity, I have to leave a copious amount of knowledge out of this presentation, but there are some very important components to Ariadne's myth which we need to discuss. The first is Ariadne's crown, which is the constellation Corona Borealis, located in Libra, which is ruled by Venus. Looking east, this constellation reaches its zenith during May, which is Taurus. Next is the magic sword of Theseus, which is Chrysaor, the Christ sword, located in Pisces which is exalted by Venus. Theseus uses this magic sword along with the ball of red string given to him by Ariadne in order to go deep into the labyrinth and slay the Minotaur. So what is the labyrinth? Well, it's located in your cerebellum, which is your lower mind, which is ruled by Taurus. The labyrinth is in your head, and you, it's you, hero, you must use Ariadne's red thread and the Christ sword she gave you to slay your lower mind or base impulses in order to attain enlightenment and true salvation. You must mind your mind, and if you're looking for her thread, then turn your face to the east and witness the first ray of the new rising sun. Now at this point, I hope you're satisfied with the fractal I've shown you that manna is indeed like coriander seed. And to tell you the truth, there is so much more. But at this point, I think we've explored this fractal enough to give us a green light on coriander. So all we have left to explore is why when manna was left until morning, it bred worms and stank. So the first thing to notice is the clever double entendre that manna bred, bred worms. And survey says for the number one answer on the board, this is an allegory for your cerebellar vermis, again, located in your cerebellum. Vermis is Latin for worm, and it is located in the same place as your labyrinth, known as the arbor vitae, or your tree of life. This is the worm in the wood, and this reminds me of another biblical passage I read once upon a time. Let's also remind ourselves that the Jewish Seder plate is filled with five bitter items. Ladies and gentlemen, We've made it through our checklist. So where would you like to go from here? How about the fact that Ariadne's red thread is the exact same red thread that the holy harlot Venus, also known as Rahab, secured out of her window for the 12 Israelite spies to capture Jericho in the Promised Land. And take note that the Egyptian feast is called Hib, thus the Semitic Rahab is cognate with the Kemetic Rahib, which is Ray's feast or the sun feast. And it does flow with milk and honey. So where does the Passover historically come from? Well, here is a basic geographic overview of the origins of both Easter and Passover. Please understand that Easter and Passover are two separate festivals that fundamentally celebrate the same thing, which is the rebirth of the spring season, fertility, and life in general. Now in specific, Easter, highlighted in blue, traces its origins from the ancient Sumerians in and around Uruk, beginning around circa 3500 BC at the mouth of the Persian Gulf, and the primary deity worshipped was Inanna, who is the goddess of love, beauty, fertility, and war. She was later amalgamated into Inanna Sin, which is Venus in the moon, and later into another personification of Venus known as Ishtar, who is cognate with the word Easter and Esther. Of particular interest, Ishtar is also cognate with the West Semitic goddess Astarte, who is the Hebrew goddess Asherah, the consort of Yahweh. Take note that her sacred symbol was the Asherah pole. Now, Inanna's sacred cult performed sacred marriage rituals, 
and evolved into the cult of Ishtar, which involved sacred prostitution rituals. Now fast forward to the Neo-Assyrian Empire circa 820 BC, and the real and historical Assyrian queen, Shemuramat, ruled Babylon for five years. She was deified as Queen Samiramis. Now, her ritual cult came from the earlier foundations of Ishtar and Astarte. As Samiramis, queen of heaven, she emerged from a giant egg that landed in the Euphrates River at sunrise on the first Sunday after the vernal equinox. To proclaim her divinity, she magically changed a bird into an egg-laying rabbit. The priest of Ishtar would impregnate young virgins on the altar of the goddess of fertility at sunrise on Easter Sunday. One year later, these priests would sacrifice the three-month-old babies on the altar at the front of the sanctuary, then dye the Easter eggs in the blood of the sacrificed infants. The festivities then culminated on Easter Sunday when the priests would slaughter the symbolic wild boar that killed Tammuz and everyone would eat ham on Easter Sunday. So in summary, this ancient Sumerian cult, which transformed over a few thousand years, made its way from Sumer to Babylon, then spread to the Levant and found its home within Christianity. Now, Passover is not the same as Easter, but similar, because fundamentally they are both celebrations of the fertility and life of springtime. But ultimately, Passover comes from pre-dynastic Egypt. Over the course of time, it first migrated to Mycenaean Greece, then from Mycenae to Crete, from Mycenae to mainland Greece. Now, the Israelites brought the Passover rituals with them out of Egypt during the Exodus and overlaid a mytho-historical motif on it to make it their own. Fast forward a few hundred years, and the Israelites rituals were further influenced during their exile in Babylon and brought some of this influence back during their later return to Jerusalem, such as the salt-dipped egg on the Seder plate. So let us go back in time before the Exodus and take a good look at ancient Egypt. Ladies and gentlemen, long before there was an Akkadian moon god named Sin, and even before the moon god Thoth, there was the pre-dynastic and original Egyptian Ithophallic moon god named Men. He was the moon god who fathered himself with his own mother and known as the bull of his mother, and his symbol was the white bull. His cult was centered around Koptos, and his shrines were crowned with bull horns. Now, one very distinguishing feature of his cult was the use of wild prickly lettuce, which has known aphrodisiac and opiate qualities. When this lettuce is cut, it produces a milk sap, which was fractally recognized as semen. And you can be absolutely certain that this is how bitter lettuce ended up on the Jewish Seder plate for the fertility ritual called Passover. Another feature of his cult was that during the harvest season, his image would be taken out of the temples and brought out to the fields in a four-day festival called the Departure of Men, where they would bless the harvest, play games in his honor, and most importantly, climb a huge tent pole that symbolized his penis, which is undoubtedly the origin of the Canaanite Asherah pole and the much later pagan Maypole festival. Likewise, the pharaoh was expected to impregnate his wives, and he would also offer up the first fruits of the harvest. This should sound familiar to the Jewish people. Yet the phallic statues of men were placed in the entrances of houses in hopes of curing sterility, which was seen as a sorrowful curse. And women would touch the penis of the statues of men in hopes of getting pregnant, which is a practice still continued to this very day. was known as the god of the high plumes because of the two giant feathers on his crown. However, they are also symbolic of two moonbeams illuminating his mind and of the orgiastic season called spring when the moon and everything comes into full plume. He has a flail that scholars identify as symbolic of the pharaoh's authority which is superficially true, but it is more important to know that metaphysically it is symbolic over his attainment of the light. He wears a red ribbon that trails to the ground, 
Some scholars say that this represents sexual energy, which again is superficially true. But I think I've shown you enough to conclusively prove that this red ribbon is the original red ribbon that was eventually transposed into the Greek myth of the red string of Ariadne, which modern Greeks tie around their pinky finger, and the Jewish myth of Raham's red rope, which modern Jews tie around their wrist. From the anatomical point of view, the red ribbon is symbolic of conquering your lower mind and escaping the labyrinth, which is why it streams from the back of his head, the cerebellum, ruled by the bull. And from the celestial point of view, it is symbolic of the first ray of the new rising sun. Notice the accompanying ordinal portions of the red ribbon of men's cross in his heart. This is a man who used his mind to balance his heart and attain true illumination and a universal personification of a mind-born sign. In summary, the Passover celebration traces its origins to the pre dynastic Egyptian is also at the root of mind, King Minus, the Minotaur, the Minute, and the Month. All of these words contain the essence of the moon. During the Middle Kingdom, men was synchronized with his solar counterpart Horus and became the deity Men Horus. And by the New Kingdom, he was synchronized with the old Egyptian moon god Amun, who was a member of the Hermopolitan Ogdoad. He then became Minamun. From Minamun, you get his predominant exported variations to include Hyaman, the Canaanite Elhaman, and the Phoenician Baalhaman. Now, the moon god Amon replaced an even older version called Montu, who was worshipped in Upper Egypt in the district of Thebes. Now, Montu had also been synchronized with Ra, and in this form, uh, he was illustrated with the falcon head and solar disk as Montu Ra. However, his older pure moon form featured a bull head, or in other words, he was a minotaur. Now, this may surprise you, but among his oldest forms exported out of Egypt, you'll find Hammurabi in the founding dynasty of Babylon. Now, King Hammurabi is the quintessential Babylonian king and is remembered for three things, building, conquering, and law-giving. Now, Babylon was a minor kingdom before his ascension to the throne, but after defeating the Elamites, he soon conquered all of Mesopotamia. Everyone paid tribute to Babylon and King Hammurabi. And under the reign of Hammurabi, he heightened the city walls and expanded the temples, and the national god was Marduk. King Hammurabi was revered as a conqueror, praised as the divine lawgiver, and worshipped as a god. His conquest came to be regarded as part of a sacred mission to spread civilization to all nations. Even hundreds of years after the empire he built had collapsed, he was still revered as the model ruler, and many kings and kingdoms proudly claimed to be his ancestor. He even became the pivotal frame of reference for all Mesopotamian events in the distant past. Now that's a legacy. Of particular interest, he is best known for the Law Code of Hammurabi, which is noted for bearing a striking resemblance to the Laws of Moses. But even more importantly, look at the Hammurabi stele. It features King Hammurabi with a raised right arm in worship and receiving the 282 laws from the people. Sound familiar? And notice his raised right hand and praise the Samash, as well as the Egyptian false door that the god Shamash sits upon. Notice that Shamash has the waters of life flowing from his shoulders and also wears the quadruple flanged helmet. And take note, Shamash is handing King Hammurabi the Zoroastrian ring and rod. And all of this is carved into the penile glands of a large ithophallic stele. Now, did you know that Hammurabi wasn't even from Babylon? He is known to be from the Northwest Semitic-speaking Amorite Kingdom, which is located in the Levant, with a capital city of Sumer in Phoenicia. In fact, the kingdom of Amuru is directly named after their god Amuru, who is also known as Martu, who is Marduk, the sacred bull of Utu.
This nation was established circa 2000 BC as part of the new Egyptian empire. Now there is considerable scholarly disagreement about the etymology of the name Hammurabi and about the only thing agreed upon is that it doesn't originate from Babylon. So now that we've followed the path to the Amorite kingdom, let me offer you the following in, in etymology. Ham, Phoenician Hammon, derivative of Egyptian Amman. Ur, Semitic word for light, conjunctive with rabbi, Semitic word for master. And I seem to remember another deity that had a raised right hand and a wrecked phallus. Even Egypt's greatest general kings called themselves Mighty Bull, Son of Montu. Montu is with a strong right arm. By the way, here's a bas relief of King Hammurabi, which is actually Shamash, on prominent display in the U.S. Congress. And here's the Presidential Unit Citation, which is our nation's highest military unit award. So now that you have a better understanding of Hammurabi, who was a physical man, but also a form of the moon god, Menamun, let's look at some of his other faces. In the Old Testament, we have Ham, you know, the supposed cursed son of Noah, who founded Egypt, Canaan, Cush, and Punt. There's also Haman and Hamadatha, the Agitites, found in the book of Ishtar, known to you as the book of Esther. And the Quran tells you that Haman was the high priest of Pharaoh at the time of Moses. And the moon in his hand takes center stage as the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And in Zoroastrian religion, the moon shows up as the concept of Vohumana, the good mind. And even before Vohumana was the Rig Vedic Vimana. And there is also the 14 Manu, who are mind-born sons of Brahma and the progenitors of humanity. And the Roman equivalent is the deity Minerva, which is cognate with the Egyptian Minervus bull. And here we've come full circle. So maybe now you have a better idea of how humanity goes from this great lawgiver to this great lawgiver. So just as we trace the moonlight master, King Hammurabi, back to Egypt, this time we'll trace a moon in his form called Moses out of Egypt. So Amon's going to moonwalk over in order to make room for some more synchronization. Now, Yah was another archaic moon god, whose name is literally the Egyptian word for moon. By the time of the 18th dynasty, Yah had become less prominent than the other moon gods. Now, Yah was an older deity than the moon god Khonsu, who is depicted with a falcon head and moon disc. And since Yah was the older deity, he came to be considered as the adult form of Khonsu, and thus... Kansu became more often depicted like Yah as a child. Eventually, he was synchronized with the moon god Thoth and became Yah Jehudi, god of the new moon. And it was said that when Kansu caused the crescent moon to shine, women conceived, cattle became fertile, and all nostrils and every throat was filled with fresh air. And during the reign of the 18th dynasty, Kansu, otherwise known as the artist formerly known as Yah, Amun, syncretized as Amun Re, and his wife, Mut, composed what was known as the Theban Triad. And this divine trinity had it all. They had the shepherd's crook, the triple flail, the Wa scepter of power, the vulture headdress, and the united crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt, the feather of truth, the platform, the braid, the foxtail, the ankh, the red ribbon, and the two moonbeams pouring into Amun's head, which eventually morphed into the two tablets of Moses. As the patron deity of Thebes and the national deity of Egypt, Amun Re ruled the Egyptian pantheon for over 500 years. Let's talk real quick about the Hyksos. The 15th dynasty of Egypt was a foreign rulers known as the Hyksos. They ruled a portion of Egypt and coexisted with the 16th and 17th Egyptian dynasties in Thebes. Now Josephus equated them with the Jews, and many people today do as well. Conversely, the late antique historians Sextus Julius Africanus and Eusebius said that they came from Phoenicia, and this would make them Canaanites. 
And many modern historians take this position and have amassed a considerable amount of data that supports that they were indeed Phoenician. Now, if we back up in time to the reign of Pharaoh Sunnisret II, circa 1890 BC, we find in the tomb of the 12th dynastic official Khnumhotep II, a painting that identifies a foreign party named the Amu, and their leader was named Abishu the Hyksos, coming to pay homage to the Pharaoh. Given the timelines, I postulate that the Hyksos, known as the Amu, were a party from the early Amorite kingdom, known as the Amuru kingdom, and from the same stock as Hammurabi. The evidence also suggests that they were not bloodthirsty invaders, as written by Manitho, but rather, they had a long trade relationship with Egypt, which makes particular sense because the Amorites were an Egyptian colony. However, with the decline of the 13th and 14th Egyptian dynasties and the subsequent splintering into various kingdoms, the Hyksos rose to power and controlled Middle Egypt up to southern Palestine. This also explains how they coexisted alongside the 16th and 17th dynasties located in Thebes, because they were cousins. And given this as evidence, I agree with Josephus that these were the original Jews. And I also agree with Eusebius that they were originally of Phoenician Canaanite stock, and in specific from uh, the, the Egyptian colony which became the Amuru kingdom, and numbering among its sons as King Hammurabi. Now, an easy way to correlate this is that just as Babylon had their great conqueror, builder, and reformer, King Hammurabi, Egypt had their great conqueror, builder, and reformer, Pharaoh Yamoses I, who defeated the Hyksos and thus began the famous 18th dynasty. He reunited Upper and Lower Egypt and reasserted control over both Nubia to the south and Canaan to the north. The Aegean was also part of his empire, and he traded with his cousins, the Minoans. He reorganized the administration of the country, reopened quarries, mines, and trade routes, and began massive construction projects that culminated in the last pyramid built by a native Egyptian ruler. He also rebuilt the pyramids of his predecessors. Pharaoh Yamosis, whose name means Yah is born, I'll say that again, Yah is born donated a tenth, which is a tithe of all productive output toward the service of the traditional gods, with the god Amun eventually being synchronized with Amun Re, and who became the national deity for nearly the next 500 years. It was during this time that the Greeks imported Amun into their pantheon, where he was worshipped as Zeus Amun. So it was under the 18th dynasty that Egypt attained the peak of its power. It is known as the golden age of Egypt's wealth, power, and prosperity. When you think of biblical Egypt, you're thinking of the 18th dynasty. It is also known as the Tutmosid dynasty, although a close look at this dynasty's genealogy reveals at least 17 people named Moses, which is really an Egyptian title that means born, just like Christ is a Greek title that means gold. It was also the 18th dynasty that formalized the five-fold royal naming protocol, and in this regard, you can see that five was an important number, just like the five books of Moses and the five subdivisions of Psalms. So if you're looking for the biblical Moses, you should be looking at the 18th dynasty. Now, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to hone this down to three pharaohs, those being the founder of the 18th dynasty, Yah Moses, which we've already discussed, his sixth great-grandson, Amenhotep IV, better known as Akhenaten, and finally Akhenaten's very famous son, Tutankhamun. Now keep Yah Moses in the 18th dynasty in mind when you contemplate the following four questions. Now, Amenhotep IV was the sixth great-grandson of Yah Moses, and you can see his affiliation with the moon god Amun and the moon god Yah in his name neferu re -Yah. He was born circa 1373 BC and died circa 1334 BC. 
Now, Rabbinical Judaism calculates that the Biblical Moses lived circa 1391 to 1271 B.C., which gives us an exact overlap during the 14th century B.C. Now, the Bible tells us that Pharaoh granted Joseph land to settle in Goshen, where his descendants, the Hebrews, continued to live and grew prosperous, and that Moses was born in Goshen. Take note that Moses' grandfather was Levi, who was born on the first full moon, in other words, Passover. Let's compare this to Akhenaten, who is known to have had a strong affinity with his maternal side of the family. His mother was Queen Taie, and a commemorative scarab that was found states that her city was Zawarka, which was the capital of Goshen, and in general considered to be the end of Egypt. In fact, the 18th dynasty had rebuilt and fortified the city, and it was considered to be a summer residence of the pharaohs. Now, the scarab states that Amenhotep III went back to Queen Taie for a sort of second honeymoon, and that they celebrated the Feast of the Lake and then sailed on board the ship Aten Gleams. This is the first mention of the Aten and indicates that a monotheistic cult of Aten existed in the land of Goshen before the birth of Akhenaten in Goshen. Trace this genealogy one step back and you'll find that Queen Taie's father, Akhenaten's maternal grandfather, was a foreigner named Yahweh. Yahweh was a key advisor for Amenhotep III and carried such titles as Chancellor of Lower Egypt, Prophet of Men, and his Superintendent of Cattle, Second Prophet of Amun, Sim Priest of Heliopolis, Divine Father, Father of the God. In other words, this man named Yahweh was a God. The Pharaoh was the living God, and his family members were also gods in their own right. And coincidentally, the biblical story of Joseph bears a striking comparison to the historical Yahweh as well, and this hasn't gone unnoticed by scholars. It is also worthy to notice that Akhenaten had an uncle, an uncle named Onan, while Moses had a brother named Aaron, and that Moses, son of Amram, had a sister named Miri Am, as compared to Akhenaten's daughter wife, Miri Aten, or that Moses contacted God on Mount Horeb, and the final pharaoh of the 18th dynasty was Pharaoh Horemheb. By the way, Horeb means hardest jubilation. He was the commander-in-chief of the army of Pharaoh Tutankhamun, son of Akhenaten. And while the mythical Moses is claimed to be the first monotheist, Akhenaten is historically the first monotheist. And we've mentioned that it's the 18th dynasty that began the tithe, that is, giving a tenth through the temple. And Psalm 104 is nearly identical to the great hymn of the Aten. And while Moses' exodus from Egypt is a myth with zero evidence, Akhenaten's exodus is well documented as he departed Thebes, built a new capital 200 miles away, cut ties with the old ways of Egypt, and barely ever returned. And in the last five years of Akhenaten's reign, the plague which had struck Egypt under his father is believed to have caused the deaths of three of his daughters, his mother, Queen Taie, and his wife, Kia. And finally, one of the symbols of the pharaoh was the wise scepter of power, which was the symbol of the fourth gnome, that being thieves. And the parallels keep going. Just like the Israel tabernacle, the God King Tutankhamun was buried inside a prefabricated portable pavilion that is nearly an exact description of the Hebrew tabernacle. Tutankhamun's portable pavilion is composed of four shrines that fit one inside the other. All wooden parts are gold-plated and even the posts stand on silver sockets. A set of ten beautifully embroidered curtains cover the sides and top of the framework. Covering the second shrine was a linen veil decorated with gilt bronze daisies representing the starry sky, and furs covered the outermost structure. And Tutankhamun's tomb also had an Ark of the Covenant, complete with four attached and retractable poles. The triangular lid is even known to be called the Mercy Seat.
We use a version a version of this even in, until today called a military field desk, which holds the commander's various orders, administrative paperwork while on campaign in the field. In other words, it holds the orders or laws, just like Moses' Ark held the laws or commandments. And of particular interest, it shouldn't go unnoticed that the dimensions of the biblical Ark of the Covenant are the exact inner dimensions of what is commonly called the King's Sarcophagus and the Great Pyramid of Giza. And if you're specifically looking for the cherubim, you'll find them on the outer doors of the portable pavilion. And you'll also find them embracing the outer sarcophagus of Tutankhamun within the Holy of Holies. And to think that each of the Pharaoh's treasures were replicas of their predecessor's treasures all the way back to the beginning of the dynasty with Yah Moses. So if you've never looked into the face of a God, behold the face of God. These physical men were mind-born signs. They had attained the ineffable light, what Plato called the brilliant light of being, and they expressed it through their own cultural lens. They were God-men, and this is what gave them the divine right to rule. So just like all the other savior figures, Yah Moses is a mythicized composite character based upon a physical man. His overarching theme is a personification of the Egyptian moon god Yah, a god of war who is also the god of the Hebrews. And since observant Jews do not dare pronounce the holiest name of God, we'll just call him Moses for short. His birth scene is from Sargon the Great, who ruled circa 2334 BC. Sargon was the first ruler of the Akkadian Empire and the first person in recorded history to rule over an empire. His mythical birth story was found in the royal library of Ashurbanipal and discloses that he was born of a priestess, placed in a reed basket in the Euphrates River, which carried him to Aki, the water drawer, Aquarius, who raised him as his son and appointed him as a gardener. And an earlier version was found and dated to the early 2nd century BC, which has striking parallels with the biblical Joseph. As a reformer, Moses is Pharaoh Akhenaten, the heretic king who departed from all the traditional ways of Egypt in favor of monotheism. As a conqueror, Moses takes the synchronized moon god form of Montu with his magic scepter of power, known in the Bible as the rod of God. As a great lawgiver, his commandments are a combination of the Code of Hammurabi and the 42 laws of Mont, she being a part of the Theban trinity. And his Elohis source of death on Mount Horeb is an allegorical reference to the death of Pharaoh Horemheb, the last pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, who left no issue and thus ended the dynasty. And his death on Mount Nebo, according to Deuteronomy's sources, is allegorical for his pineal activation, as Nebo is Mercury, and Moses was able to cross 49 gates, your pineal being formed on the 49th day of gestation. So who are the Hebrews? Well, scholars have discovered enough evidence among various cultures all over the Middle East to make a solid conclusion that Habru was a generic term for the lowest social class consisting of rebels, outlaws, mercenaries, slaves, and laborers, leading a marginal or sometimes lawless existence on the fringes of settled society. And the biblical word Hebrew is cognate with Habru. So in this particular case, it appears to have been as a social category that evolved into an ethnic one. And just as the book of Exodus says, the Hebrews were slave laborers in Egypt. And the Bible also says that they were slaves for 430 years, and this puts them squarely within the time frame of the Hyksos. Now go back and read the book of Exodus, and you can clearly see the motif of the Egyptian moon god Yah and his cattle cult. Yah, the moon, is exalted in Taurus, and Moses builds an altar that he named Yah Exalted. Do you understand? And spring is the season of war, and the moon god is the god of war. His power was described in his raised right hand and with the wise scepter of power, which is a stylized bull pizzle, which the Bible calls the rod of God. Now you know why Exodus clearly states that the Lord is, quote, a man of war. By the way, notice that the wise scepter behind Pharaoh Djoser is hugging an amorphous crab, the moon ruling cancer.
So just like Moses, the story of the founding of Israel must also be a cultural myth. The earliest potential evidence of a fledgling people of Israel is found on the Myrna Patan who reigned 1213 to 1203 BC, which is approximately 80 years after Pharaoh Horemheb's campaigns in the land of Canaan. And just like today, these campaigns require a replenishable army, and the ranks are primarily get filled with laborers of the lower class. And as such, it is most plausible that the Habarus served in the Egyptian army under Akhenaten and or Hormheb, or both, and fought in the campaigns to pacify the Canaanites, and settled around the Canaanite city of Shalem, known today as Jerusalem. Fast forward 80 years to Pharaoh Merneptah, and his stele mentions that he defeated multiple Canaanite cities. However, the hieroglyphic inscription for the suspected Israel bears the hieroglyph for people instead of city, which implies they were a nomadic people. It should also not go unnoticed that the Merneptah stele was found in Thebes and actually engraved on the backside of the stele of Amenhotep III, Akhenaten's father. Of particular interest, the top of the stele features the Theban triad, which is Amun, who was synchronized with Re to form Amun Re, Mut, who was a variant of Isis, and Kansu, whose Canaanite equivalent is the god El, his symbol being the bull. In other words, Israel. Another important parallel was with Egyptian and Hebrew holy anointing oils. So let's start with the Hebrew anointing oil. The book of Exodus gives us a clear description of the Hebrew's holy anointing oil. Notice that the Hebrew's holy anointing oil is a five-fold formula which reflects the tradition of honoring the sacredness of five. Five Pharaonic names, five books of Moses, five sections of Psalms, five bitter items on a Seder plate, and five ingredients in the holy oil, which are listed in order as pure myrrh, sweet cinnamon, sweet calamus, cassia, and olive oil. And notice that their weights are of the fivefold motif as well. Now let's first talk about cassia, which is fourth on the list. Well, its scientific name is cinnamomum cassia, which is the same ingredient as cinnamon, so it appears to be double listed. However, it is more important to know that cassia wasn't even imported into Egypt until around 500 BC. So the fact that this item even shows up on the ingredients list stands as immutable evidence that the book of Exodus could not have been written any earlier than 500 BC. Now, cinnamon or cassia bark was so highly prized among ancient nations that it was regarded as a gift for gods and monarchs. From the medical point of view, cinnamon helps dilate capillaries and increases the absorption of other chemicals, which enhances their chemical effects. The ancient Egyptians combined it with cannabis oil for massages, said to connect the receiver with deities, which is a practice reserved solely for priests and high-ranking people. Next is pure myrrh. Now, the Egyptian word for the pyramids was myrrh, and myrrh is an analgesic just like opium. It has been used since antiquity to produce pleasurable feelings. And to highlight the importance of myrrh, it was one of the gifts to baby Jesus. Next is sweet calamus, also known as sweet cane. And in Hindu culture, is known as vaca. It is both a psychotropic and a memory enhancer and has been used as a hallucinogen since ancient times. So mix all of this up with some olive oil, slather it on your head and skin, and it should be no mystery as to how these people were setting the conditions to communicate with God. The oil was deemed so holy that God said that if you pour it on your skin, if you even make anything like it, or if you give it to a stranger, you shall be cut off from your people, which effectively means killing you. By the way, the Jewish canon is called the Tanakh, and it is phonetically identical to the Egyptian phrase Tanakh, which means offering to the Ak, which is the root of Akhenaten and the Ak. Now, since proto-dynastic Egypt, the Egyptians used seven sacred oils that were venerated above all the other temple and tomb offerings and libations. 
while the ingredient list is too long to, to list. Know that there are many psychoactive ingredients and that the carrier oil or unguent was beef tallow rendered from a specially raised sacred bull. Now, these seven sacred oils and unguents were collectively referred to in temple inscriptions as the Eye of Horus and the pyramid texts, which are the oldest complete religious writings in the world, speak directly of the seven sacred oils. Collectively, the seven sacred oils were indispensable elements of the temple foundation ceremonies, such as laying the cornerstone, daily temple rituals for the gods, and the process of mummification. These fragrant oils would magically invoke the divine living breath of the effective spirit known as the Ak, which was your light body. They were also instrumental in operating the false door and bringing the images and hieroglyphic inscriptions to life. And here are two Egyptian oil palettes from the Old Kingdom that held the seven sacred oils known as the Eye of Horus. Given all the other synchronicities, you can be certain that the seven blossom menorah that God told Moses on the mountain to build in the book of Exodus is a culturally distinctive rendition of the remnant knowledge of the Egyptian palette of seven sacred oils. By the way, almonds symbolize your pineal. So just as we spoke earlier in regard to how the story of Ariana served to highlight the many confusing transitions within the fractal, this slide serves to highlight the many confusing historical transitions within the fractal. In other words, trying to unravel the fractal, which is hypercubital in nature from a historical or chronological perspective, which is linear in nature. So let's begin on the left of the slide with ancient Egypt. Now, the oldest reference about the elusive nature of the fractal is found within the pyramid text, where it talks about trying to grab the eye of Horus that bounces around. This metaphysical concept has also been captured in the biblical stories as the mirrored bedchamber and the multifaceted gem. And the 14th century Catholic priest and Platonic revivalist Marsilio Ficino called it the Hall of Mirrors. Much later in the 19th century, General Albert Pike wrote about this elusive quality in his book, Morals and Dogma, where he said, and I'm paraphrasing, that when you look at it from one angle, it changes into something else, and then you look at it from that angle, it morphs into something else. Okay, from a historical point of view, you can clearly see that the Hebrew story in the book of Exodus is firmly rooted in the ancient Egyptian hidden wisdom of Amun, which itself traces back to the moon god Men. Now, many people don't know this, but the Hebrew Bible wasn't codified into a written account until between 180 to 120 BC, and at the very latest, 280 BC. The letter of Aristides states that the chief librarian of Alexandria urged the Greek pharaoh Ptolemy II to add the knowledge of the Hebrews to the library. The story says that the Jewish high priest of the second temple chose six men from each tribe and sent this delegate of 72 learned men to Alexandria. And in exactly 72 days, they produced in Greek what is called the Septuagint. By the way, they also put a curse on it should anyone even change a single word of it. The delegate of 72 was then lavishly showered with gifts and upon making their own copies of the Septuagint, returned to Jerusalem, where this was the official Bible used in the Second Temple. So drawing from the wealth of knowledge housed at the Library of Alexandria, and during a time of Middle Platonism, when both Jews and Greeks were attempting to synchronize their histories and religions, you can easily see how portions of the ancient Greek stories were incorporated into Jewish literature as they fused together what would become known as the Bible. The Septuagint even reads like a Greek cosmology. For in the beginning, Theos created Uranus and Gaia. So following the moon down and to the left, you can see how the biblical lines that pertain to manna being like coriander seed were introduced as this path takes us back in time to the stories of King Menas, the Minotaur, and the Labyrinth of Honey, your mind ruled by the moon. 
And following the path from the moon up and to the left, you can see how the stories of Zeus and his diet of milk and honey and manna juice, which is physically reflected in the manna ash tree, were also incorporated into the Jewish story of Exodus. The manna ash tree was sacred to Zeus and Ariana. The Greeks named it the Melia tree, which means the honey tree. And it secretes a sweet sap known as manna that's said to have sprung from the blood of heaven and was often described as, this should sound familiar, the sky falling juice from the stars. Now following the Greek manna tree path all the way to the right of the slide leads us forward in time nearly 2,000 years into the Norse Yggdrasil tree, which is described in the Prosetta circa 13th century A.D. The Yggdrasil tree is the sacred world tree whose branches reach to heaven and from which honeydew falls to earth on which the bees feed. So the mythical descriptions of the Yggdrasil tree appear to be rooted in Greek mythology and also cross-pollinated by the earlier Aramaic interpretations of manna. So in Hebrew, the traditional explanation is that manna is derived from the question manu which means, what is it? Now, the Hebrew alphabet is derived from the Aramaic alphabet, which is in turn derived from the Phoenician alphabet. So in Aramaic, the word man translates as aphid. So people have asked the question, does manna mean, is it aphids? Interestingly, an aphid is a small insect that feeds on plant sap, then secretes a sugary liquid from its anus that resembles a dewdrop, which is called honeydew. And bees do indeed feed on this honeydew. And there are a few other insects, such as aphids and cicadas, that pierce the flow of sap-rich plants. And when the insects move on, the sap leaves a white sugary crust that is called manna. So it's clear to see that someone in the ancient past saw the Jewish story reflected in this fractal of light, which eventually earned the sticky sap, the namesake of manna. Now following this path to the bottom right of your slide, you'll see a cicada or locust. So one of the passages that has puzzled scholars in the book of Matthew is the passage that says John the Baptist ate locusts and honey. Now, this can be understood if you know that before the canonized version of the book of Matthew that ended up in the New Testament, there was the Jewish version called the Gospel of the Ebionites, which is truly the oldest book of Matthew. In the Ebionite version, you get a passage that is closest to the Hebrew scriptures when it says that John the Baptist's meat was wild honey, which tasted like manna, formed like cakes of oil. Note that ekris is the Greek word for pancake. Now fast forward about a century, and you'll get the much more refined version called the book of Matthew that ended up canonized in the New Testament, and which, through the editing process, has been refined, polished, and rendered down to the phrase, John ate locusts and honey. Acris, the Greek word for locust, being mistranslated. And it's clearly a mistranslation because the Ebionites are known to be vegetarians. Perhaps the editor of the book of Matthew noticed that the seeds of the manna tree are what is called feathered seeds, which look like a cluster of locusts. So we went over a lot of symbols. And we have one more ingredient to go, and that is the lamb shank. And from the fractal, the lamb of God is Aries. Notice that the shank is the lowest portion of the hind leg. Notice that the root of the word shank is ank, from where you get words such as ankle, ankh, and ach. And just imagine, all of this is contained within the solar year, which begins on the vernal equinox. Imagine what can be uncovered as we explore the celestial order of magnitude known as the Great Year, which begins when we rise above the galactic plane in the age of Aquarius. By my reckoning and the reckoning of the heavens, you are right here, right now. Many cultures have diligently watched the stars for the signs and the seasons. Astonishingly, the cultures that pinned a hard date to the return of knowledge all fall within a 10-year time span from 2012 to 2022. My own personal midnight visit happened in 2018, so this direct experience is my own personal standard. 
However, if you wish to choose a technical, technically precise date, there is no better choice than the scientific astronomical vector equilibrium that occurred on 21 June 2020. This was the exact center point in the galactic alignment of the precessional cross. On this exact date, we had an annular eclipse directly over the capstone of the Great Pyramid, which gleamed from the tip of Orion's club as he arched over the heavens. The geometry also aligned the annular eclipse in the pupil of a geometric eye in the sky, all circling the square. So the ancient Egyptians, or whoever built the Great Pyramid, wins the games. The Gnostics also get an honorable mention. As the Apocryphon of John does specifically say that God returns on the meridian of time, which is this alignment. Christianity also gets a barely veiled allegorical thumbs up. The book of Matthew, who is Aquarius, tells you that no one knows the day or hour. The angels don't know. The son doesn't even know. Only the father knows. And in case you don't know, the motto of Aquarius is I know. And it's time to do some celestial spring cleaning. For my Christian cousins, it's at the galactic level that the lion lays down with the lamb. Listen, unless you get your mind past the mundane, literal level of learning, you will forever be lost in the shadow of the true church. That shadow known as corporate Christianity. And it will be more than willing to fleece you, your widows, and your orphans out of every penny you own. And the rest of the world is no exception, for the same shadow haunts all religions. And to think, I've barely even scratched the surface of information on the solar year. And the great year is equally as chock full of knowledge, if not more. And honestly, my mind has gone beyond these wheels, even beyond the galactic wheel, even beyond the super galactic wheel. The wheels turn for the mind born. Here's the oldest Egyptian snake god, Neheb Kal. Pay attention, Jews and Christians, because this is the primordial walking snake cursed to crawl on his belly. And according to Kalki's calculation, this galactic deity takes 225 million years to eat his own tail. And while 70 and 72 years is conveniently used to measure one degree of solar arc, technically one degree of solar arc equals 71.6 years. And a mathematical check on learning proves it to be true on many levels within the fractal. You must wake up. As the great Moses de Leon told you, you must get your mind beyond the mundane level of learning. You must activate your pineal and open the 49 gates so you can truly understand higher consciousness concepts resonating out of our cultural past and into your present moment. You must occupy yourself and become a mind-born son. It is the medicine for your eye and for your soul. It is the ultimate medicine that will cure the woes of this world. To summarize all of this, ladies and gentlemen, here's a roll-up of the items we've discussed on the prayer plate. Again, this metaphysical knowledge is not meant to detract from the traditional viewpoints, but rather to complement them. I love my Jewish cousins. I love humanity. And no matter how you choose to view the light we all know as God, no matter how your particular culture celebrates the annual return of light, I wish you all a healthy and happy life. How beautiful to know that man is the moon.